Thank you very much. Here, if you guys can all pass the mic around and tell me what you want to be doing in outer space. So for we've got Solar budget monitoring. Solar budget monitoring. How much solar radiation the Earth gets. Protein crystallization and purification. Human colonization. I guess it would be stop the asteroid and have another place to live, which is basically colonization. Does anyone here know what the job of a lawyer is? <laughs> Any guesses? The job of a lawyer Keep me out of trouble. is a lot of the time, at least as people see it, to say no. And I'm going to tell all of you why you cannot do what you want to do right now. You want to provide transportation. How much insurance are you carrying for that? However much the FAA tells me I need to carry. Very good. What kind of environmental mitigation are you providing? Uh, again, whatever the FAA and NEPA requirements are. Yeah. We're starting to see a trend here, right? All right. And you want to provide exploration. So are you going to take people up when you do that? Well, I can't cover the liability insurance, so we're just going to send a robot to Saturn. Okay. And what? What radio frequencies will you be using to communicate with that robot? Uh, I was going to call the FCC and I was going to secure a number of them to provide some wireless. Again, I see a trend emerging. Let's see. Solar protein crystals. OK, these are commercial ventures in outer space. So you know, how would you get paid for those? OK. So would you be providing these services to foreign nationals or only to American citizens? So you would, of course, have the necessary clearances from the Department of Commerce uh, to, prov to provide those services to foreign nationals? I didn't, I, didn't say I didn't say Department of State. I said Department of Commerce, because it's not just ITAR out there, which, of course, most people here, many people here may have heard of, but there is a there's a lower bar, but there is still a set of regulations governing the export of knowledge or materials uh, out of the country. It's, ITAR is defense. Okay, thank you very much. Will do. So, as you can see, there are a lot of problems, and these problems maybe are not natural problems. You know, getting into space is hard. But these are problems which may become because there are rules or regulations which. Uh, go ahead. And so the question I asked was, what do you want to do in outer space? Um, I would say invest. Invest in what? Invest in oh, invest in general. Sure. Then you, you would want to invest. Are you a qualified investor under the SEC's regulations? You know, these are important questions. You know, do you have a, what is it, a net worth of at least a, a million dollars? Does someone know what the SEC regs are? Yeah, the current is a million dollars or there's a uh, annual income that you've received over the last five years. $200,000. Thank you very much. So do you have that? then it might be hard for you to actually do that. If someone solicited you, it would be problematic for them. Again, these are problems which come about, or, or apparent problems which come about, because the government has said, no, you cannot do that. Would we be better off if the government didn't have any of these regulations at all? Any thoughts? Uh, it depends on which one's talking about. I, I actually like the FAA regulations for space launch. Um, because they do provide a certain amount of safety for those around the area. Um, on the other hand, ITAR is just silly. Okay, so uh, fundamentally we have a problem. We've got some rules, some regulations, some laws, and maybe some of them are good, and maybe some of them are bad. But we don't get to just pick and choose. When you've got the laws, 
they're on the books, they're the laws, you kind of have to obey them. You know, government kind of doesn't like it when you don't do that. Um, and we've got a current set of laws in this country which come in a variety of different forms. Law is formed from constitutions which tell you how a government runs, from treaties which are agreements between governments, and then in the United States, we've recognized that you know, gov governmental functions break down into three different kinds. There's legislation, which is the act of making law. There is execution, which is the act of enforcing the law. And then there is the judicial function of adjudicating disputes in the law. And so we have three different kinds of laws which exist. You have statutes, which are the work of legislatures. We've got cases, which are the work of courts, and we have regulations, which are when Congress says, well, we'd like the executive to enforce the law here, but there requires a level of detail which maybe Congress isn't very well suited to dealing with. And that Congress can't even handle the high-level stuff. Forget you know, figuring out what the right level of, you know, uh, of carcinogenic materials in a given environment is for. And Congress just tells the president, tells the executive branch, we want to regulate this. We don't understand it. You go do that. You enforce the law. You make the law. And a regulation is, as the courts have determined, if it's within the area where Congress has told the executive to go and make a law, it's a law. You know, if the EPA is going to be regulating something which is not environmental, then that's probably not going to stand up. But if they're regulating the environment, which Congress told them to do, that's a law. It doesn't matter that Congress did not pass. They once passed a law which told the EPA go and regulate in some way. And so we end up with a veritable thicket of laws here, and sometimes they conflict with each other, which is why people hire people like me. But um, the fundamental law that we deal with in the outer space context, there are really two which are the utmost importance fundamentally. And the first one is the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, which says that all treaties are the law of the land, as if they were the Constitution itself. They are the supreme law of the land. And the second is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which says that Congress has the power to regulate all international and interstate commerce. And the courts, in their wisdom, decided long ago that that power is plenary, it is absolute, covers everything that can possibly be covered, that's commerce, and you can't really do anything about it. Um, at once upon a time, during the Depression, Congress passed a law regulating how much wheat could be grown, and a farmer said, well, I'm just growing this wheat for myself. I'm not selling it to anyone. I'm baking my own bread. That's it. And the court said, well, you're affecting the aggregate supply and demand for wheat, and you're covered. So eventually, you had something called the railroad. And it went beyond one state to another state. And so you had interstate commerce that was meaningful for the first time. And Congress said, well, we'll create the Interstate Commerce Commission. And we'll give it all the power to regulate railroads. And new forms of transportation developed trucking. The ICC said, we're going to set the rates. We're going to set the schedules. We're going to set how much you can pay people. Uh, and eventually, the ICC becomes something that we know today and love as the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation has many functions, including the FAA, which covers all air transportation. Now, who here owns property? Who here owns a house? You know, show of hands. OK. How much of the space over your house do you own? Do you own the entire atmosphere up above your house? In most states in the United States, you do, in fact, own everything up you know, well, it's not really clear where your ownership ends. But do you control that thing that you own? Do you control that entire air column? The FAA controls access to that airspace because it is, although that particular piece of airspace is right here. It's right in this state. It's right in that state. It's not going anywhere. Moving through that airspace is an interstate transportation. It is an interstate commerce. And so the FAA gets to control who enters it, who exits it. The, 
that becomes a problem if it goes up high enough. There was a real estate developer in Tennessee who said, I'm going to build a 1,400-foot tower here. It's going to be a commercial building. And the FAA said, sorry, you can only build up to 800 feet. Because if it went any higher, they would interfere with approaches to an airport. Let's stop and think about that for a second. Wow. This is property. You own it. The courts don't contest that you own it. You have every right to do anything you want there, but the FAA, because somewhere, somehow, there is an interstate transportation connection, gets to tell you, you can only build so high. We also have something out there called the Outer Space Treaty. And the Outer Space Treaty was an agreement in the mid-1960s between the United States and Russia, because they were both terrified that the other side would get to the moon first, would plant a flag there, and say, I claim the moon for the United States, for Russia. They were afraid the other side would get there first, and so they said there is no national sovereignty or right of appropriation in outer space. So when you get to outer space, you've got two conflicting imperatives now. You've got the FAA, which controls it, or controls access to it, but also there is no ability for the government to actually claim ownership if it can't have sovereignty, what rules is it enforcing? These problems were purely hypothetical for some time. In the early 1980s, uh, we had the first wave of private rocket inventors. Uh, I think the Conestoga, was that right? And the fellow who was doing that, do you recall his name? Because I don't. I don't. Okay. Uh, the fellow who was doing that went to find out what he needed to do to launch this rocket to carry private cargo into space. And it turned out, well, we didn't really have a whole lot of laws on the books to deal with that situation. But the FAA said, hey, we control the airspace. And the FCC said, hey, we control the telemetry. And the Department of State said, well, what about the international implications? And the DOD said, there's national security concerns here. Department of Energy said, you know, is, are there any nuclear sources involved? There were no fewer than 14 federal agencies which asserted jurisdiction over this. Uh, I have done a rough order of magnitude calculation. Uh, the heat death of the universe would occur before you were able to get approval from all 14 federal agencies on something like that. Um, you know, just one is hard enough. And so Ronald Reagan passed something called the Commercial Space Launch Act, which said, which made certain that the FAA was the point of contact for people to go through to be getting approvals to launch things into outer space if you were commercial. But the FAA has to consult with the Department of State and with Department of Defense because of international security concerns. We have international treaty obligations. Uh, and in practice, I suspect you have not encountered this yet. In practice, they can exercise, is that a question? Very cute. That is what Google is for, people. Um, and so they can, in fact, exercise effectively an absolute veto. Uh, you know, if DOD says, we don't like that, it doesn't matter that FAA is the point of contact, DOD can just shut that down. Uh, Department of State can. I don't think they have. They can shut something like that down. It could make the process harder than it has to be. The, the various departments that need to be consulted have to uh, give a valid reason and a method to work through the problem and find a solution. Have you encountered this yourself? Uh, so far, we've gotten uh, all thumbs up from everybody. Uh, the, I think the biggest issue was at one point the FCC, but we just worked on that through the, uh, the range itself and just said, okay, well, give us, you already have these frequencies. The FCC said, yeah, we can't do anything about that. Speaking of which, I forgot to say this at the beginning, the views represented here are not those of DOD or the Department of the Air Force. Uh, that is an important disclaimer. I am not here in an official function. Um, and so that is simply what you need to do to just get something up there. Now, if, say, Mr. Maston, you were to launch something up into space and it crashed into someone's backyard somewhere, who, without getting into too much detail, who would be liable for that? Absolutely. 
Uh, treaty obligations specify that the United States government is liable. Of course, they pass that on to the launch operator up to a maximum amount. That's right. Under the Outer Space Treaty, objects in space, because in the 1960s, people were not thinking, oh, there are going to be private entrepreneurs who are going to be launching things. The only people who were launching things were national space agencies. So under the Outer Space Treaty, an object in space, any damage caused by it is the absolute liability of the government from where that object was launched. If I launch from the middle of the Sahara Desert, the government of Mali, which has all of two pennies to its name, is absolutely legally liable. I have a question. So the question is, what if we have a launch pad in international waters? Wow, that is a very good question, because you are without a national jurisdiction. Under the Outer Space Treaty, that's a very good question. Uh, and potentially the answer is there is no one who is absolutely liable. But um, there would be ways around that. Some governments recognize that uh, any any action by their citizens anywhere in the universe um, obligates that government. Um, in the case of the United States, it does not matter where you're launching from. For example, the uh, sea launch launches from out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and they are the U.S. government has accepted uh, liability for any damage from that vehicle. Um, and I believe the Russian government has also or not yet Russian, Ukrainian government, has accepted some portion of that liability as well. And of course the corollary to that is they accept responsibility for their citizens doing anything anywhere because they want to collect tax revenue from their citizens doing something anywhere. Exactly. So it's got a, it's got a double-edged sword. <laughs> exactly. But you know, of note, in those instances, that is because the government specifically said we are carrying this liability uh, and what's the flip side of that? That means they're exercising control over you. And in the United States, the United States exercises control over you. The FAA exercises control over your launch. If you are launching from the United States, or if you are a United States citizen or commercial entity, you know, uh, corporation, anywhere in the world from where you launch, the FAA controls you. So you can't just go to the middle of the Sahara Desert and expect to get away from having to provide the insurance and financial responsibility the FAA asks or from meeting the NEPA requirements. I don't think you get out, out of those even if you're in the middle of Sahara. Nope, you got to meet all of those. And so there is no easy way out. And that's just getting up into space because once you're outside of the atmosphere, well, hey, right? There is no national sovereignty in outer space. So you're free to do whatever you want, right? You can do anything. You can, you can murder someone, not a problem. But um, we have some precedents from maritime law which apply and which I think are codified uh, or at least recognized in the FAA regulations, you know, that the FAA is exercising authority over that vessel even when it's in space. No? No. Wow. Okay. The FAA is very clear that once you achieve orbit... The FAA is very clear that once you achieve orbit, they ha no longer have any jurisdiction over you. And until you are about to re-enter. Is the logical answer, but you know the law is not really a logical thing a lot of the time. So I was actually a little surprised, and it's rare to have someone at one of these talks who actually knows more than I do, which is why I appreciate very much having you here. So uh, the the point that was made earlier about um, uh, if it's a U.S. venture, but I'm launching from foreign soil, so the Iridium Cosmos collision, both vehicles were launched from Ru what is now Russia. Uh, but it was an American corporation vehicle banging into a Russian-owned uh, vehicle. Who's, who's responsible? The laws are actually not clear on that point. Now, does anyone here know what happens at sea in that situation? Uh, you know, the Coast Guard has the authority to set the rules of the road at sea, and at least in U.S. waters. And if you've got a dead vessel... Uh, and you have a vessel under power, the vessel under power is always liable for hitting the dead vessel because the dead vessel can't get out of the way. Uh, and that cosmos was dead. It could not get out of the way. But there are 
no rules of the road for outer space yet. Now, there are some papers out there on the creation of a space guard with authority similar to the Coast Guard to do just that, to set rules of the road, but we run into this problem in the Outer Space Treaty. There is no national sovereignty in outer space, so who creates the space guard? Um, and, you know, people say there are parallels to exploration back, you know, several hundred years ago. You know, there were treaties back then. There was a treaty, uh, Treaty of Tordesillas in the early 16th century. The Pope said half of the world belongs to Spain, half of the world belongs to Portugal. Really simple, right? That's how it worked out. Um, uh, in fact, people pretty much ignored it once they actually started going places and doing things. Uh, and one of the things about the Outer Space Treaty is, well, people have not actually engaged in any substantial interplanetary commerce or settlement yet. And we'll see what happens when the rubber actually hits the road. Well, you, were, you were asked the question earlier about the FCC and uh, who allows you to get the frequencies that you need, that sort of thing. You're having that food fight now between the French, the Saudis, uh, the UAE, the Iranians, and uh, I think there's someone, el someone else in Europe that, that's fighting over one single spot in geo. How does that play in? So spots in geo are also organized under a treaty. You know, it's done by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, and because the FCC, of course, controls United States communications, uh, and if you are a U.S. citizen, it will exert control over you anywhere. But uh, for those slots in GEO, people recognized early that there needed to be a forum for dealing with them, uh, and actually the organization responsible for making sure mail goes internationally became the organization responsible for making sure telephones go internationally became the organization which now also allocates slots in GEO. Um, and this, of course, is a major, there are major food fights right now because, lo and behold, the European and American and Russian interests got a lot of those slots pretty early on, and the rest of the world kind of feels that they got cut out of a lot of the real estate. But there are slots which are reserved and which are still empty out there because of that concern. Oh, God. All right. So the question is, who is authorized to negotiate with aliens? Um, to my knowledge, there are no binding laws on the subject. Uh, at, you know, at NASA, there is an Office of Planetary Protection, um, and that would probably be the first stop people went, but they're more concerned with contamination issues than diplomatic protocols. I don't know that they've got actual... I suspect that they would, yes. Who cares about the UN? I just uh, want to point something out in negotiations. You know, it's ultimately um, interesting tidbit of, you know, uh, power comes from the end of a gun or whatever. So it's whoever can enforce what they're saying gets to talk, right? That might be, but, you know, it depends who's got the bigger guns, the aliens or us. Uh, you know, if the aliens decide that the people they're going to talk to are, you know, Cameroon, then the, and the aliens got the bigger guns, then Cameroon might be our representative to, you know, to the aliens. Is there any regulation of optical communication, like laser? Um, so yeah, there, there's actually quite a bit of regulation. Some of them is as uh, um, seemingly stupid as don't shine a laser at an aircraft. Um, I don't think that optical communications are as well regulated in terms of like uh, radio waves. Um, but there's definitely an issue that comes up uh, when trying to work out of a uh, federal range. That's interesting because as far as I'm aware, I've only seen the FCC regulations governing, you know, well, I guess a lot of them use electromagnetic spectrum as, as their basis. I guess light would, fo would, would be the you know, electromagnetic spectrum, but I hadn't really thought of that in that context. So there you go. Sure. Well, that, might, that I think is an FAA reg as far as shining the lasers up at airplanes. agencies um, regarding lasers, the use of lasers, um, a lot of it, you know, ex like I said, except for, you know, like the, the obvious stupid ones like 
don't shine a laser at a pilot. Um, um, a lot of them you're probably not going to run into, and you could probably get away with as long as you don't harm anybody and don't cause anybody any mischief. So the question is whether lasers are listed as part of the safety regulations at the federal ranges. If your payload or your vehicle has lasers on board, you will have to disclose that. You will have to go through a whole bunch of safety processes with the range about the use of the laser. But if you don't launch from a federal range, if you are not launching out of that depends, you know. You know, there possibility exists that you can be doing, you know, be, well, that would, if you're getting supported out of Western Range, then you'd have to be, does Sea Launch get support out of Western Range, do you know? Is Sea Launch supported out of Western Range? No. Okay. So, yeah, if you are, if you're, so if you're not launching out of the Eastern or Western Ranges, which, you know, are controlled by the Air Force, then you get to make, you know, as whatever, you might have whatever national regime you're operating under, and I don't. I, I have no idea what the Russian or Ukrainian laws are on the subject. So, um, but that would be the relevant authority. Yeah. I think there are still U.S. interests in it. So, well, in any event. Thank you very much. I, I hope this was educational for people. And uh, I, I will have a, I might come back tomorrow if people are interested with a, actually this I just did on the spot, but I have a presentation on ethical considerations and regulation of corporate activity in outer space I can bring back if people are interested in that. Okay, cool. Thank you very much.